needs rehearsal going on. One thing a performer really needs is rehearsal. The other is white teeth. How about you? If you need white teeth, why don't you try Pepsodent? Right, Mary. Pepsodent gets teeth their whitest, with the lowest abrasion of all leading toothpastes. Teeth that need to be white need Pepsodent. Why don't you try it? everybody and welcome back to a very special podcast. This is the podcast in which we watch all of your favorite TV shows and then discuss them over a glass of wine. I'm Patrick M. Dunn and you probably remember me from the previous episodes and I'm joined here as always by Kat Halstead, the author. Hello! Oh, and I shall preface that I am laying in a bed for this episode. Yes, it's actually a little unsettling. I'm very dehydrated today, um, and I know I did say that this is the podcast in which we drink wine, but it's actually Pedialyte today. Oh, Pedialyte? It's for babies though, right? Yeah, I give it to my nephew. Oh, well, I think, well adults can drink it too. Why not? Um, but pre, pre-podcast, pre Kat and I were having a very wild discussion about dinosaur porn. Why did you have to bring that up? We've never read it. At least I've never read it. I don't know about Patrick. I've never read it either. So we were talking about, there was a BuzzFeed article about the least interest in erotic scenes in literature. Is that what it was? It was the um, 13 terrible sex scenes in fiction this year. I'm pulling it up on my phone. So it was this year. It was not of all time. Yeah, it was just this year. And you mentioned something about how an author compared it to a tennis match. It's from A Doubter's Almanac by Ethan Cannon. The act itself was fervent, like a brisk tennis game or a summer track meet, something performed in daylight between competitors. And then somehow our conversation spun over to dinosaur porn, which is a literature available on Amazon, we, we, we learned. Yes. So... If, if any of our listeners are interested in it, please head over to Amazon. <laughs> yeah, if you're really interested, I'm sure you can still find it. <laughs> All right, so what are we doing tonight? Um, tonight we are doing the iconic 70s series, Mary Tyler Moore. We are doing season one, episode two, which is titled, Today I Am Ma'am. Uh, as in ma'am, as in you're an older woman? Yes. <laughs> because this is where Mary realizes that she is now in her 30s. And she's not young. And her life is going to be a downward spiral of bacon curls and bad dates. Exactly. And not understanding youth culture. Yeah, because she's apparently 30 now and she's single. So what is she living for? Because we have to remember, this is 1970. And this is episode two. So in the first episode, she takes this big risk and moves to Minneapolis. Yes, after she and her fiance broke up. All right. So do you think she got all the way to Minneapolis? She landed this new job and her boss, Lou Grant, is like, you're an old woman now. Do you think that was when she realized she's like, oh, shit, maybe I made a horrible mistake. That was awful, that moment. Mary's like, well, I'm young and I enjoy the show. And Lou's like, you're not young. You're out of that age range, according to the ratings. I guess the ratings on their fictional show like dropped like a tiny bit. Yeah, they dropped like a point. <laughs> not even a point, like a point of a point. But they're freaking out. <laughs> they're all freaking out. And so, so I guess Mary must be the baby of the office. Mm-hmm. And... 
she she soon learns that all the old guys now see her as a peer and not as a dumb 1970s version of a millennial. What, what were they, baby boomers then? What were they called? Yeah, they were all baby boomers. Yeah, I guess that's right, huh? Because they're the baby boomers are post World War Two. Yeah. So, so how old was Mary Tyler Moore in real life at the time of this episode? <laughs> Probably close to I think the age that she was playing. Okay, because I assumed she was thirty in Dick Van Dyke. No, she was young. So Dick Van Dyke was robbing the cradle there. No, there was an episode where um, Mary revealed that she was actually younger than Rob thought. So there was maybe a question about whether or not they were actually legally married. <laughs> is, is there an episode where Dick Van Dyke picks Mary Tyler Moore up from high school? <laughs> How come we didn't do that episode? Uh, I don't know, because we did the Walnuts one. All right. So surprisingly, this was a show that aired on CBS on Saturdays? Yes, Saturday nights. I think Saturdays actually used to be like a hot night for television. All the 30-year-olds were staying home and watching this. Let's be real. People were married. They had kids. They weren't going out to the bars and hooking up. Instead, they'd they'd stay home and they'd watch the CBS lineup, which consisted of Mission Impossible, My Three Sons, which apparently was still on at this point in time. Ran for a really long time. See, I'm thinking My Three Sons was on around the time like I Love Lucy was on. Uh, no, it was the 60s. So maybe like the Lucy show? The one that's not quite real to me. The one with Gail Gordon. Which one's that? Is that the one with our kids? No, you're thinking of the third one. Then there is one from the 80s with Jenny Lewis. That's the one with our kids. No, there's there's an older one with her kids where her kids are like teenagers. Oh, wait. No, no, no. The one I'm thinking of actually had her kids on it. The one in the 60s, those weren't her kids. Her and Desi's kids. I'm Googling this right now because I think we're getting this all wrong. Wait, first I gotta get something out. So here's Lucy is the one that has Gail Gordon and her real-life children. That's the one I'm thinking of. Mary Tyler Moore was 31 in 1970, by the way. Okay, so she she was playing a year older. I mean, a year younger than she was in real life. (laughs) No, she was playing, like, her age. All right, and are you ready for the TV Guide summary of this? Yes, give me... Well, no, you haven't told me what else was on. Mission Impossible was on that night, but what else? Uh, In My Three Sons. My Three Sons. And then, for some reason, whatever was on at 9 o'clock is blank, so I don't think they actually knew it was on this night. Oh, wow. It was on the other channels. No data. No data available. Really? Yeah, I think once you get once you get pre-1980s, it's really hard to find out what was on these particular nights, because it was probably something that got canceled, and no one just kept track of this information, or this, like, this particular TV guide was lost. Well, probably. I'm sure they have an archive somewhere of TV listings in the TV Guide archives. <laughs> in the TV Guide Museum. <laughs> but, but I mean, they have to have all their issues, right? I would imagine. I would hope so. Or they got to have them scanned in now. Probably some poor intern who's like, old TV Guide used to be awesome. What is this mess I'm working for now? Yeah, like back in 2001 when the internet was like really taken off, they probably picked up some intern. His job was to scan every page of TV Guide ever. (laughs) He's probably still down there. (laughs) He probably is. He's only on like 1987 right now. He's like, I don't know what's going on. It's like uh, Blast from the Past, that Brenner Fraser movie where he's down in the the bomb shelter. Yes. And then... (laughs) And then he gets out. He, he'll finish next year and he'll get out and Donald Trump will be president. And he'll be like, what? He like, the guy from NBC's The Apprentice. He's like, wait, he won't even know what The Apprentice is if he's been down here that long. Oh, uh, I think they had The Apprentice in 2001. I'm asking Google. What year did NBC's The Apprentice start? Oh, come on. 2004. Oh, okay. So he doesn't know what The Apprentice is yet. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be like a Donald Trump, that like rich guy who pops up like in a cameo or something once in a while. Yeah, like didn't he do WWF episodes here and there? He was just this guy, everybody who knew who he was, but he didn't have a TV show. It wasn't, but he married these fabulous women and he had these fascinating divorces and such. So, yeah, and you probably know him from like the National Enquirer and stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's where. You would have known our now president-elect. He's like, you know what? I remember scanning that guy's image 600 times. Tonight on a very special Different Strokes, Donald Trump drops by. Donald Trump and Mr. Drummond were probably friends. Probably had some real estate deals together. Uh, But speaking of TV Guide, I have the TV Guide summary of tonight's episode. Yes, let's get to it. 
everyone. We love to read the TV Guide summaries because we try to decide if they are an accurate depiction of the episode we are discussing. Mm-hmm. So are are you ready for the TV Guide summary of Tonight I Am, Ma'am? Yes, I am. All right. At Rhoda's Urgent, Mary tries to deal with her singles blues by reluctantly throwing a party for all their eligible male friends. All their eligible male friends? Oh, this just got way sadder. First of all... I don't think it was a party they were throwing. They were just trying to get laid. They were just trying to get a little something something. They just realized that they were in their 30s, they're alone, and they now, if they go out to a bar now, people probably look at them as, like, those old broads. Oh, God. They create a list of all of their eligible male friends (laughs) and and who they're going to invite over to their, their shag palace. Okay, so what... Do they live in an apartment building? Like, where do they actually live? This is what... They live in a Victorian house that has been converted into several apartments. So Mary lives in one apartment, Rhoda lives in another, and then Phyllis lives in one? Yeah, Rhoda lives in, like, this tiny, like, studio apartment up in the um, attic, which is basically, like, a, the smallest room you could possibly think to be living in. <laughs> so who's, whose apartment were they hanging out with in the episode? You don't recognize Mary's iconic apartment? I didn't really watch the show too much, to be honest with you. Oh my god, Patrick. I may have seen two episodes. And this this makes three. And Mary's apartment is enormous, too. Well, it's enormous for basically being a studio. Basically a gigantic room, which you could probably fit 50 people in. And then there's like a tiny kitchen that is an offshoot of it. Yeah, the, you can barely fit two people in. And so Rhoda gets like a tiny closet upstairs. <laughs> Rhoda's apartment is about the size of Mary's kitchen. Okay, so it's definitely not the shag palace that Mary has. No, it's not. And does Phyllis live in the building too? Yes, Phyllis owns the building. So she's the landlord. It's her house, and she just rents these two rooms out to these old maids. I, I, There might be more people in the building, I don't know. This Victorian house is in a suburb of Minneapolis, or it's in the actual city? No, like, it's in Minneapolis. Okay, I see, I've, I don't, I know it's a city, but I don't really have any concept of what it looks like. It, it It's a city. It's like a major city. Well, you have the two cities. You have Minneapolis and you have St. Paul, the twin cities. <laughs> Did you just mansplain geography to me? I just womansplained you. But there's a Victorian house in in the midst of all this? There's several. There's like neighborhoods where there's Victorian homes. Well... The exterior shot, it looks like it might have been in a park or something. It just did not look like a city city life. Oh my god, you're going to make me go through my pictures later and have to find you pictures of houses in Minnesota, aren't you? You might have to. Uh, how many Pedialytes have I had tonight? You're so wacky on them. All right, so you want to hear some wild things about the show that I learned? Let's hear it. All right, so the original concept of the show, they wanted Mary Richards to be a divorcee. Ooh, scandalous. Yeah, too scandalous for 1970s television because then they feared that viewers might think that Laura divorced Rob from Dick Van Dyke and fans would have hated her for it. That would be like the absolute worst. They were like America's favorite couple. Well, if the show took place in the 1990s slash 2000s, it would have not have been a big deal. Maybe. It would have been like hearing that Madonna and Sean Penn broke up. Are you comparing Rob and Laura Petri to Madonna and Sean Penn? I was trying to think of an iconic modern era couple. And I don't even think Sean Penn and Madonna are modern era. They're not. That's like, oh my god. How about Gwen and Gavin? The, uh, no, wait. Oh, I was getting my Gwens confused. Gwen who? How many Gwens do you know? I was thinking. Gwyneth Paltrow, not Gwen Stefani. Do you know that I share a birthday with Gwen Stefani? Fun fact. I did not know that. Shout out to Gwen Stefani. Shout out to October 3rd. (laughs) All right, so CBS Network did some research, and they warned the series co-creator, Alan Burns, that there were four things viewers, especially the mainstream audience, would never accept in their living rooms, which would spell early death for a TV show. All right, you're going to pick your jaw off the floor. Okay, and what were they? So the four things are New Yorkers, Jews, divorced women, and men with mustaches. Rhoda's two of those. I'm sure she's dated a man with a mustache at some point in time. 
I'm sure there I know there were men with mustaches on that show. And now I kind of want to go through TV shows of 1970 and try to find shows that involve any of those four things. Yeah, that's going to be a fun challenge going forward. If you think about it, there are a lot of shows about New Yorkers these days. The entire NBC lineup throughout the 90s involved New York and divorced women. And Burt Reynolds, hello, he had a mustache on Evening Shade. Magnum P.I. He had a mustache. And also, hold on, there... Are you aware of the Mary Tyler Moore murder? Wait, what? All right, so there. All right, so there's an episode of Mary Tyler Moore. Actually, there's two episodes that involve a prostitute named Sherry. I vaguely remember. Okay, so she was a prostitute that I guess Mary had relations with, not sexual relations, but like a friendly relation. And she appears in two episodes. And is this the she was portrayed by the <laughs> went on to um, star in Phyllis? <laughs> okay, thanks for ruining my story. Sorry. Go on. She was portrayed by the actress Barbara Colby. Producers were in love with her so much that they asked her to come back to Phyllis, which is the spinoff of Mary Tyler Moore, starring Cloris Leachman. Yes. They had just filmed three episodes, I think. And Barbara Colby, she was on her way home with a male friend. I guess they were coming back from like an acting class. And they were murdered. They were just shot and killed in Venice, California. That is terrifying. Nobody knows who killed them. The culprits were never caught, and they it's a cold case. So maybe we could solve this murder. Uh, I don't think we could. You don't want to be an internet sleuth? Isn't that what gets Sandra Bullock into trouble in the net? She starts internet sleuthing something? Yeah, but that's 1990s internet. Now people do internet sleuthing all the time, and there, there's no murder conspiracies. I watch 48 Hours. I watch ID Channel. You don't listen to the 600 true crime podcasts that delve into these kind of things? I I, I listened to the Generation Y true crime podcast. The others, there's something off about them that always make me want to, like, turn it off. So I do. Okay. That's probably people that listen to TV show podcasts. They listen to ours and go, you know what? There's something off-putting about this one. I can't, I can't quite put my finger on it. There's something wrong with these two. So thank you for listening. All right. So shall we get into the actual episode? Yeah, let's get into this episode and then we can get back to more fun facts all right so the episode opens in it's is it wjm is that the name of the tv station yes it's wjm because it is named after the owner wild jack monroe so they're in the wjm studios they're they're actually they're in lou's office they're all in lou's office having this meeting about the ratings and this is where um lou's freaking out because they dropped a little bit and mary's like well i like the show and i'm young and lou's like no you're not the ratings are 18 to 29. You're not 29 anymore, so you're old now. Which, if that's not bad enough, the male kid, the male boy, calls Mary Ma'am. Yeah, so this the mailroom carrier is coming through. He's got everyone's uh, packages and stuff. And Mary's in, the, in his way when he's trying to get out of the room. And he's like, excuse me, ma'am, can you move for a second? And she's not paying attention. She doesn't really, she hears it, but she doesn't realize that he's talking to her. Not at all, because she's never been called ma'am before. All of a sudden, it dawns on her, and her soul is burnt to a crisp right there in Lou Grant's office. (laughs) Yes, it's soul-destroying the first time you're called ma'am. So she goes home, she pours a scotch and soda, she's just laying on her couch, and just kind of spilling the tea with Rhoda just about her shitty day. Yeah, they're having dinner because apparently Mary cooks dinner for both of them, so Rhoda's that friend, just comes over and eats your food. Well, she doesn't have a kitchen, probably, because she lives in a broom closet. So they're having dinner, and they're talking about how much it sucks to be single, how they're 30 now, so that means they're old, according to their friends and family, even though they might not feel like they're old. Yeah, it snuck up on them. They didn't see it coming. Yeah. Mary was busy at work. She probably didn't even have enough time to stress out about her age. Because she didn't think it was a big deal, because she's excited because she's got this great life right now. She's got a, a job she never thought she'd have before as an associate producer. Didn't she apply to be a secretary? Yeah, she did. But she ended up as the associate producer instead. Yeah, they're like, oops, we actually already have a secretary, so we don't need another one. But you can be the associate producer if you want. <laughs> it's like, hey, listen, we don't have anybody else to be our CEO right now. So how about you do it, random person? <laughs> she moves to a brand new city all alone. 
worried that she's not going to have any friends and just immediately lands a job she's probably way underqualified for. Yeah. Now, Rhoda is now trying to lift up Mary's spirit. So she comes up with this crazy idea. You know, maybe we should make a list of all the men we know, ex-boyfriends, uh, male cohorts, just anyone that might possibly be single that we could invite over to a, it's not going to be a dinner party. But just some kind of gathering? Yeah, I think it was just to like get them out of like the slump or rut that they think they're in because they haven't gone out on dates for a little while. Maybe it was just kind of the, you know, we still got it kind of night. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh yeah, maybe we're not like as desperate and alone as we feel like right at this second. This is a really short list because they could each only come up with one person. <laughs> yeah, it's like really depressing. And even then, Mary doesn't come up with her own Rhoda suggests that they bring, that Mary invite Ted Baxter. And Mary's like, eh, no. No, 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 no. Yeah, would you want to invite the guy that you work with after seeing him all day? And now he'll know where you live? No. Mary brings up, I guess, before she was engaged, she was going out with this guy, Howard, that she kind of remembers, but doesn't really remember too many details about him. Yeah, which, that seemed a little odd to me. How do you kind of barely remember somebody you dated? Uh, well, it was the 60s. She was probably a wild child in her 20s. Oh, it was Phyllis who suggested Ted. But Phyllis then is the one who brings up Howard. Because Phyllis has brought back a bag of ice, which is now just a bag of water. Because she was stuck talking to another tenant. So Phyllis knows Howard? This is where I got confused. I was always under the impression when I used to watch Mary Tyler Moore regularly that Mary moved to Minneapolis and didn't know anybody. But I guess in episode two, the writers decided that Phyllis used to know Mary before she moved to Minneapolis. Maybe they ran into each other somewhere, <laughs> like they were acquaintances, and Mary got to Minneapolis and she's like, oh, you know what? I should look up Phyllis. Yeah, or maybe they were like sorority sisters in college or something weird like that. Were they the same age? Because I assumed that Phyllis was just a few years older, at least. Yeah, I kind of get the. They could have been sorority sisters. Or she just maybe looks older. I don't know. Maybe Phyllis was a hard partier. Uh, yeah, she would probably definitely. I would guess she was definitely older. She looks a, like she's aged a little more than them, too. She's got the crow's feet already. Phyllis is starting to get the, the skin sag. So she's probably like an older friend or something. Maybe um, Mary was a freshman in college and Phyllis was a senior and she was showing her the ropes of whatever college she went to. She was like the big sister or something. Yeah. Like, you know how on 90210 when they had would have the seniors hang out with the freshmen, like the freshman buddy or whatever it was? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what it was like. Okay. So she remembers Howard and Mary's like, yeah, you know what? Let's, let's, I'll give him a call. And... Rhoda brings up a man that she just met a few days ago that she ran over with her car. Yes, because that's perfectly normal and healthy. That should have been the episode right there. That, I want to know more about that, really. And Rhoda just brings this up to Mary, like, oh yeah, this is a guy that I just met the other day when I hit him with my car. Like, she's never mentioned it before to Mary. As soon as that happened, I would have went downstairs and told Mary, like, oh my god, I fucking ran somebody over with a car today. He's okay, he's alright, I just hurt his arm, but I ran a man over. Yeah, exactly, that's totally the kind of thing I would, like, if you walk into the house, you're just like, oh my god, I just ran somebody over. Yeah, instead of Rhoda's talking about this guy that she just met a couple of days, he's a total catch, he's handsome, all this great stuff about him, and then she just casually mentions that she ran him over. And Mary, Mary doesn't even, she gives it a little bit of a second thought, but they quickly move on from that idea. Like, Mary doesn't ask for, like, more details about this. I don't think you'd want more details, really. Uh, well, don't you want to know if, if a potential murderer is living upstairs above you? I mean, as long as she, like, answers the phone, it's okay. Was it an accident? Was it intentional? Was Rhoda drunk? Like, what, what, what is the details behind this, this, this incident? I'm sure Rhoda was distracted with, like, stuff for the window dressing at the uh, department store, and this guy walked out into her way, and she just, like, tapped him in the elbow or something. Is it Donaldson's? Isn't that the store from the opening theme song? No, it's um, Himmel's or something like that. I forgot to write it down. The only thing I remember from the opening theme song is, so remember when they show a picture of a woman after Mary throws her hat up in the air? Mm-hmm. 
they I just remember seeing on that woman on TV a couple of years ago, they interviewed her for some reason. There's a woman in the background. She looks at the camera. So her name is Hazel, Hazel Frederick. And it was a cold day in downtown Minneapolis in 1969 when they shot this. They used hidden cameras. So she had no idea that they were filming the opening of a theme song. So, Anything? Yeah. So she just, you know, said that she just saw this woman like stop and gleefully throw her hat into the air. So she just looked at her like... What the fuck is this woman doing? And then, like, I don't know, like six months later, this is on TV and she's part of it. It's probably one of those things. She probably wasn't even watching it. And all of a sudden her phone starts ringing. You're on TV, darling. You're on the TV. Yeah, she's on this TV show that's now iconic. It's been on the air nonstop since 1970, pretty much. There's two fucking idiots talking about her right now on a podcast. In 2016. Uh, shout out to Hazel. Okay, so um, Rhoda calls Howard because Mary's still kind of hemming and hawing and gives the phone to Mary and Mary invites him over and she's on the phone with him and she's just like, she cannot get off the phone with this guy. He's one of those. And she hangs up and she's like, I remember him now. He's too much. He's too loving. He's too understanding. He's too caring. He's just too much. Basically, he's a clinger. Yeah, he's way too clingy. Uh, he remembers exactly the last time that he saw Mary. He knows it's, it was four years ago, three weeks, and like two hours or something like that. Yeah, it's like really kind of sketchy and creepy. Like, oh my god, this guy with the internet? He would be full on stalker. Yeah, he would be Facebook creeping right now. <laughs> Yeah, he'd be like all up on her Facebook, her Twitter, her Tumblr, her Instagram, her Snapchat, everything. As soon as Mary calls him, she's like, you're not going to believe who this is. And then you don't see his side of the conversation. So then you just hear her say like, oh, yeah, how'd you know? This is before caller ID is even like imagined. Do you think that Howard, every time he answered the phone, he just assumed it was going to be her? Oh, my God. He spends how many years? Four years? Saying, Mary, is that you? Every time the phone rings, he's he stops for a minute and he's like, all right, this could be it. He takes a deep breath and he's like, hello, Mary, is that you? <laughs> She's got a call. It's her. It's her. Oh, hi, Aunt Gladys. Uh, so I'm really surprised. So Mary just moved to Minneapolis. Where did she move from? <laughs> just like not that far away. Another Minnesota town. Okay, because I was trying to figure out why this guy just happens to be close by that he can just drop by the next day on short notice i don't think they ever actually said what town she was from but i mean where i lived it was only like a couple hours away i was assuming she you know traveled from another state so so if things went sour with her moving suddenly to minneapolis at age 30 she could have just moved back to wherever she came from very easily yeah she could have moved back with her parents I don't know, that kind of like cheapens the thrill of it all for some reason. Well, actually, she probably could have moved back in with her parents because I don't think she lived with her parents before. I think she lived with her boyfriend that she was engaged to. I think that's implied is that she was living with the guy. She was living with a man before she got married? Ooh, scandalous. So scandalous. <laughs> and then she runs off to work on a TV station. With the most misogynistic boss possible. Oh, he could have been way worse. Lou really wasn't that bad. They definitely toned him down for television, but in real life, he would have been a jerk. He he would have been like Roger Sterling from Mad Men. Oh my god, yes. Okay, so then Rhoda goes and she calls her guy, and she invites him over, and he's like, yeah, I'll bring m my wife and I would love to come. And she hangs up and she's like, yes, my date is bringing his wife. <laughs> it's so funny that she just assumed it was going to be... A date because like neither of them said it was a date doesn't rhoda say to him like i want to come over and just follow up on my patient just because i feel bad th that i ran him over like it just could have been a pity exchange maybe you know what i'll make you dinner tonight just come over um maybe we'll have like a cobbler like a peach cobbler after and watch manix on television <laughs> a peach cobbler and manix that's the old netflix and chill peach cobbler and manix you mean like back in the 50s when it was like yeah come over i have a tv so we flash forward to the next day and the guests arrive. And I believe Howard is the first one to show up. Yes. And he like snaps a picture of Mary as she opens the door. It's like super creepy. I guess he's a photographer. He's like an amateur photographer. And he just kind of settles in very quickly. And he just keeps going on about how beautiful Mary is. And Mary's not feeling it. He's too clingy. And you know, Rhoda's date is there with his wife. And the wife is this gorgeous skinny blonde. And Rhoda's feeling even worse about herself because she's like this frumpy New York girl. So how old was Howard supposed to be? Because he seemed like he was a lot older than her. Oh, God. 
you know, he was probably like at the most 35. But again, remember, we've gone over this the whole like looking way older than you actually were back in the day. Yeah, because this guy had salt and pepper hair already. I mean, but to be fair, Steve Martin had salt and pepper hair way young. That is true. Shout out to Steve Martin. And the one, there's a problem though. All these guests, even though it's eight o'clock at night, they're all expecting dinner. This is, this is really strange. So Mary and Rhoda, they assume that if you invite someone over to your house at eight o'clock, that automatically cancels out dinner. Yeah. And the only thing that they had to offer for food was baking curls. (laughs) What is a bacon curl? I'm going to go look that up. Is it like candied bacon? I don't, I don't know. No, I'm thinking, like, it's probably like bacon wrapped around something oh it's like okay google it's basically just bacon that you curl that's all it is curl bacon instead of having it flattened out in in like a crunchy stick form you just curl it up so all they prepared was bacon curls and scotch and sodas i would think you'd need more than like one kind of appetizer at the very least yeah, maybe some popcorn or like something sweet maybe cheese balls or veggie sticks yeah, Cheetos. Do they have Cheetos in the 70s? Probably. But I mean, you're inviting people over to your house. I, I don't understand what their end game was. I don't get it either, because this is not something I feel like would happen today. And so Armand is Rhoda's quote unquote date, right? That's his name? Yes. Right, and Nancy was Armand's wife? Yes. What do you think Nancy was thinking? This woman hits my husband with her car and invites us to dinner. Yeah, she's like, oh yeah, you are not going to that alone. Do you think that Nancy and Armin were swingers and that's maybe where they thought it was going towards? You know what? Actually, I think they were just totally so in love with each other and oblivious that they had no clue. Nancy was really into Rhoda. Like, she wanted to be friends with her. Well, she's like, oh, you're so nice. I don't think, I just think Nancy was nice. I don't think it was anything like we're swingers as soon as they said that armin's coming over with his wife i was gonna i was expecting this shifty-eyed woman all night long just kind of like rolling her eyes at rhoda and it was the exact opposite of that because rhoda's the shifty-eyed girl rolling her eyes all night at nancy <laughs> they didn't do any cut scenes so armin and nancy left after like 10 minutes <laughs> well they all left howard stuck around a little bit longer but there was no cut scenes so they just stayed for 10 15 minutes and then just bailed the party well, that's because they were starving because they didn't eat dinner because they thought going to a dinner party. Do you think that, that Nancy, Armand, and Howard, as, as soon as Rhoda and Mary went into the kitchen to talk for a minute because they had no food to offer, they were like, you know what? Let's just go to the, the Applebee's down the street. Let's just hit up the Perkins down the road. So at what point does Mary Tyler Moore Show become this great show? Because I didn't really sense it in this episode. You know, it takes a few episodes where it kind of like gains its traction, but it was really popular right away. But you know, a lot of shows, they take a few episodes to kind of like figure out the ebb, the flow, the chemistry between all the characters. You know what? They, they wasn't recorded in front of, they did it in front of two different audiences. I just remember this. Um, They would do like a dress rehearsal on Tuesday afternoon and invited an audience in to watch that so they could like figure out what wasn't working. And like for the pilot... The, for the feedback after the first dress rehearsal was everybody hated Rhoda. Yeah, she was really bitchy in this episode, too. Yeah, Rhoda's, you know, she's a little snarky, sarcastic New Yorker. Stereotypical New Yorker. And Mary's your good girl, Midwestern, happy, cheerful woman. Hey, I have a shag Mary kill for you. Are you ready for this? Mary, Phyllis, and Rhoda. Wait, why did you call it a shag Mary kill? Because I don't want to say the F word. I think I would shag Rhoda. I think I would kill Phyllis. And I would marry Mary. Uh, That's kind of what I would say, too. I feel like I'm in an Austin Powers movie every time I say that word now. (laughs) Shag. All right. So what are we doing next week? Uh, Next week, we're doing an episode of Mad Men. Yes. I don't know how I talked you into allowing me to do this. I I think I was just like, hey, we'll do it. Now I got to sit through an episode of Mad Men. So I've been trying to get us to do Mad Men for the podcast for two years now, and I finally get my wish. And we are doing a Christmas one, and I think I picked a really good episode for it, too. So I hope so. Join us next week when we go back to 1964. Oh, wow. Going way back. Yes. So as always. Bye. Keep the change, you filthy animal.